The first lesson for today is taken from Exodus chapter 17, beginning with the first verse. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why do you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Our responsive reading is in your bulletin. It's from Psalm 95. And I'll begin. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. For the Lord is great, God, is a great God and a great king above all gods. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. They put me to the test, though they had seen my works. The second lesson is taken from Romans chapter 5, beginning with the first verse. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Our Holy Gospel today is taken from St. John in the fourth chapter. (laughs) So he came down to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, 
and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have five husbands, and the one you, are now, you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither this mountain nor in Jerusalem will worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back, and they marveled that he was talking to a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why you are talking to her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and to the people. The Gospel of our Lord. Maybe seated. When I was a young uh, teenager, my family had moved to a small town uh, in Illinois, and so I was probably, uh, probably even before I was a teenager, I was maybe 10, 12 years old, somewhere in that ball field. And uh, my parents had purchased an old funeral home. So some of you may have known this, but they had purchased this old funeral home. It was built in the early 1800s, and it was, a, it was one of those old, massive homes, but it needed a lot of work to it. So I remember growing up, and my father and I would be out in the summer, and we would be hammering away at getting things done, at one point, we had reshingled the whole house. I don't know how to do it anymore, so I can't help anybody who needs it, but <laughs> throwing that out there. Uh, but we reshingled the house. We put up new drywall. He did new floors. We put in a new kitchen. We, uh, I don't want to sound morbid, but when they would wheel the person into the house, there was this stone concrete slab that was about five feet tall, and it slanted downward. And so they would wheel the the casket up into, or the, the gurney up into uh, the kitchen area, and then they had the embalming station all that. My dad thought it would be a, a good idea one year to try and remove that. He didn't have a jackhammer or anything of heavy-duty tools to do this, so and so we took turns with a sledgehammer. We didn't get very far. They built it very well. But I remember these summers, and... You know, as, as we grew older, we, we had more and more chores and stuff to do around the house and outside. And, and, and I always remember, especially when we did the shingling, because it was a big house and so it took us all summer long, my dad would, you know, at the end of the day, send me up to the grocery store with a few dollars to get a couple of sodas and, and some snacks to refresh ourselves. And so we would sit outside and we'd have our soda and we would eat whatever snack we had and we would uh, discuss the next portion of the project. And you know, my dad's very you know, attention to detail and trying to get all of that done. But I remember that just over and over throughout those years, doing those works outside, especially when it was 80, 90, and 100 degree weather, we would be up just covered in sweat and dirt. Reshingling is not a clean job. So it was uh, quite a memorial for me but it was always capped with a Pepsi at the end. And I don't even drink Pepsi now, which is interesting. Uh, I will tell people I'll have it on a nice hot summer day and that's about 
about my time when I have it, mostly because of this instant. But see, the interesting thing with like a, a nice cold soda on a hot summer day is that they, they say it's going to quench your thirst, but it doesn't. In fact, it makes you more thirsty, it makes you want to buy another one. And then you drink that, and then you buy another one. See, the sodium and the salt intake in the soda makes you want to draw, uh, drink more of it. Same thing with like a Gatorade. In fact, the only real thing to quench your thirst is warm water on a sunny, on a summer day. But these waters, these drinks, and all these things that everybody, these businesses and these corporations advertise as being the thirst quencher, they don't really quench your thirst. Sprite's made a big logo out of it, to the quenching of your thirst. They don't really do that. And that's the unfortunate side. They taste good. I love having a soda with a meal every once in a while. But to really think about what their slogan is, it doesn't really work. And see, because we will always come back thirsty for more. If you ever go to a sit-down restaurant and a waiter brings you a soda and you drink that before your food comes and then he'll come back with another refill and then you drink that and now you've already put in 200 calories and so now when your meal comes, you're not really hungry anymore. Brooke and I were talking about that Wednesday. It's just easier to get water. But even that sometimes doesn't quite quench our thirst because see, the body continuously needs it. I mean, I've got a bottle right here. We always need something. We will always be thirsty. And I find it what is interesting with this passage is we really get to see this full demonstration of who Jesus is again for us. I mean, anytime we visit a text in the Gospels, we really are exemplified with who Christ is. And this is a passage that is just uh, one that speaks volumes to the journey that Christ will go to reach you. So as he is moving along in his ministry, it's still very early in this time period for him, he is weary, and so he goes and he sits by what we know as Jacob's well, and he waits. It doesn't tell us how long he waits. It says it was about the sixth hour. Did he wait six hours or did he wait only a few? We don't know. But he's waiting, and he's waiting for a particular person, this Samaritan woman. Now, in this culture, to kind of paint it out, the Samaritan women would generally come to the well later in the day after everybody else had already come to there to retrieve their water. And so Jesus is waiting for this very particular person to show up. And as normal, she comes to draw her water out, and Jesus looks at her and he says, give me a drink. Which, interestingly enough, is a shocking question because he is asking this Samaritan, the Jews had absolutely nothing to do with them. In fact, the Jews had a very low view of the Samaritan culture. And so by Jesus asking her, it is, it is something of a profound statement because this would have never happened had it been a Pharisee or any other person in the Jewish culture. They would never associate with a Samaritan. So he's already crossing boundaries that have been established for centuries. And he speaks to this woman. Now, we don't know much about her other than this very brief conversation that she has with Jesus. And it's interesting how she kind of progresses through it. She initially doubts who this person is. And he, she calls into question whether or not he's actually greater than the patriarch that they acknowledged, Jacob. And then Jesus responds with the various types of worship that will be taking place. And asserting that salvation comes from the Jews, pointing out that he is the basis for salvation. And according to the entire Old Testament, that he would come from the tribe of Judah. I noticed that when I was doing my research on this text, and I came across this from the Jews. It didn't say for the Jews. It doesn't say to the Jews. It says from the Jews, from out of the Jewish culture, the Jewish lineage, would come salvation. And so it just makes sense that as we've explored it through the seasons here, especially as we get close to Christmas, how the lineage of Christ is demonstrated throughout all the patriarchs in the Old Testament. And, of course, the fulfillment coming out of the tribe of Judah. And so it only makes sense that Salvation comes from the Jews, not just to 
not for, but from. And I think that that very word really starts to change the concept of how Christians view things because, see, we aren't of the Jewish culture. We're Gentiles. And so if salvation only came to the Jews, then what we are doing up here is pointless. But if it came from the Jews and it's for all people, as Jesus is demonstrating here, speaking to a Samaritan woman who had no business in acknowledging who Jesus is, then that makes this whole thing so much more profound because it cascades down through time as Paul becomes that missionary going out into the Gentile world calling for repentance and calling people into the knowledge of who Christ is. And in fact, what it's showing here is this slight misconception that the Jews had around who their Messiah would be. Even his disciples struggled with this throughout their time. They had this kind of notion that the Gentiles weren't worthy of the gospel. Obviously, we know the Pharisees had thought that. But here we have the Messiah, the Son of God, speaking to a Gentile, to a Samaritan woman. When normally the Jews would balk at any sort of communication, they would never have spoken to her. But Jesus is showing that through him, salvation comes to all who believe. This isn't just for the Jews, but it's for the Gentiles as well. So I was kind of thinking how I wanted to kind of frame this out and establish, you know, the, the, the point. Because really the lectionary this week gave us this really long text. It was like 45 verses long. And so it was almost the entire chapter 4 of John. So I was trying to think, like, do I want to focus on what Jesus says about this living water? Do I want to focus on what he says about the five husbands and then the one who she is with that isn't her husband? I mean, I could have pondered that and really hammered into the, that very conversation, but I really want to maybe stress something because I hear I came across quite a few sermons that focus on that, and I didn't feel like it was really the best approach to this entire text. I do want to make one short and simple statement on the text here with the five husbands. And that is this, that Jesus is drawing attention into her, what her sins are. See, this would be no different than if you had a one-on-one conversation with Christ and he would be shining the light on whatever sin was prevalent in your life. Whatever that may be. For her, it was adultery. So he's shining this light, showing her that she needs a savior. And so as she kind of progresses through this conversation with him, she goes from asking Jesus if he's in fact greater than Jacob, the patriarch. Is he another patriarch or is he just something else? But then she she goes on to establish that he must be a prophet, which now all of a sudden puts him up into another class to finally realizing that he is the Messiah. But yet, does not keep Jesus from this conversation with her. The conversation of her adultery, one that is sadly so prevalent in today's world, it doesn't keep him or prevent him from having a discussion with her. See, we we get kind of tossed around maybe in today's world that we, we think Jesus would not want to associate with sinners. He would not want to associate with those who are Uh, downtrodden in society, we would establish Jesus as just being this only coming to the righteous. And that kind of falls into the pharmaceutical thinking of it, that Jesus wouldn't want to associate with sinners. Well, we're all sinners. So that means Jesus would never associate with us if we held that belief. But it doesn't keep him from having this conversation because he knew who he was waiting for. He knew who this woman was. He knew the sin that she had committed before she even shows up to the well. He knew everything about her before she even sat down to draw water out. And this sin does not keep him from offering her the gospel. In fact, that's the very focus, is this very statement that he says to her, that he provides the water that will quench her thirst It is only through Christ that we can receive this life-saving water. So here's an interesting notion. Here's an interesting thought I came across. 
we are certainly not experiencing spiritual thirst like we do a physical thirst. We do not experience this you know, desire to go home and have a glass of water or a lemonade or a glass of milk of sort. But our spiritual thirst is, is different than the physical. The spiritual thirst is one that tries to fill a void in our soul. No matter what we do in this life, you will never fill it. For this woman, it was having multiple husbands. But for many of us, it could be other things. It could be possessions. It could be our homes, our families, our cars, our hobbies. Whatever it is, we will find that we want more because it will never be enough. It will never fill that gap. And we could assert that when one does not taste this living water that Christ offers, when they reject the water, these people are unfortunately no better than being spiritually dead. They are lost to the gospel. And see, it's only this that can bring a person back to life. This is what Jesus offers to this woman who, up until this moment, had been spiritually dead. And he offers her this life-saving water, this, this truth, this promise that only he can forgive her sins. This thirst is quenched by the water and the sacraments that we offer in the church. This thirst is quenched by the word of God and the sacraments. In your baptism, in the Lord's Supper, in the preached word, that is how your thirst is quenched. And in fact, it's a one-time quenching because now you find yourself, even though you start to sway a little bit here and there and you want to maybe try to fill a void or find something that would entertain you a little bit. Those are normal tendencies for humans, but what we as Christians understand is that there's something that we have in our minds, in our souls, that the rest of the world doesn't. We have fulfillment in Christ. And so while this thirst is something that you continuously come back to revisit, it is always quenched. It isn't, you are never a spiritually thirsty person when you partake in the body of Christ, when you are present here in church, when you are paying attention and, and absorbing the word of God, your thirst is always quenched. You are never having to come and draw from water that will leave you thirsty. And I think this is what Jesus gets at in all this, and he goes further to what I was just talking about. Really, for lack of a better words, Jesus says that we need to stop drinking the stuff that makes us thirsty. We need to stop drinking of the things in this world that promise us satisfaction, promises us our thirst to be quenched, and yet it leaves us disappointed. It leaves us desiring more. Now, again, I want to make sure we're not talking just simply about water, coffee, and tea, because those are drinks of many choices, and I'm sure in this room, but... We're talking about the, the analogy of what drinking is. It's the consumption of this world. And again, this is such a broad topic, and I can sit and, and we can talk about the thousands of things that would fill into this category, whether it's the content we watch on TV, the content we see on our cell phones from social media, what we read in the papers, our books, our hobbies, our family careers. The list just is endless. These activities that we partake and even can be a direct reflection of the things that we are missing, the things that we try to fill the void with, especially in today's world where we have schools that are having sporting events now on Sunday mornings, tournaments, basketball and, and baseball tournaments, soccer tournaments on Sunday mornings because they're trying to, to make your calendar so busy that you can't possibly even have a time to breathe. And Sunday is your day of rest. Sunday is the time that you come and you hear the word of God preached and you go home and you rest. Even if that rest involves making lunch and picking up the house and taking care of the children, you rest. You have been re rejuvenized and, and you have been re-given the word every Sunday and so you're spiritually fixed when you leave here. But these, this drinking, if you would, of the consumption of life, these things that we continuously pursue, always will leave us thirsting for more. 
We will try to fill this void. But yet, this is something we all do. We seek after it that will always leave us desiring something more. But yet, in the text, Jesus offers us, us something different. He is offering to us a thirst that has been quenched. He is giving to us this water that could cascade over everything in our lives. And here's the beauty of it. He's given it freely to you. There is nothing that you have to do to obtain this. It's not about your good behavior, your good moral standing, how good you are with your family and how often you come to church and how much money you give. Those are all great things. But it is not about that. It is not about anything that you do but it is what Christ does to you. He freely gives himself to you. Interestingly enough, as I had mentioned, how we find our thirst to be quenched, whether it's in our baptism, in the sacraments, in the word preached. A little bit further on in the Gospel of John, Jesus says this. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks on my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Consuming scripture is paramount for the Christian life. Partaking in the sacraments are vital for the Christian life. And it is a good tool that we have in our arsenal to equip us as we go out into this world. So it is helpful for us to understand this Christ, who this Jesus is. And this has kind of been our motto in the church for the last year and a half or so of really discovering this, this Messiah, who Christ is and what he does for us. To consume him in, his, in the bread and the wine, to consume him in the word, in our baptism, these are all things that are crucial for the Christian life. And it's not really just about having some simple, bland picture of what you believe in as a Christian. I made this statement Sunday night in our Bible studies. We were working through the third chapter in John, particularly with the 16th verse, which I'm sure everybody in here, I'd hope, is familiar with. But I wanted to make this statement that Jesus asserts that whoever believes in him shall be saved. But that belief has to be, has to have something to it. See, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes a statement in Matthew chapter 7 that there will be many who will come to him and will say, Lord, Lord, look at all these things we did. We cast out demons. We healed the sick. We did all this stuff. They will use these titles, calling Jesus Lord, Rabbi, Teacher. They know him. They used him but they didn't actually know about Christ. They didn't truly know him. They, they, they knew about him, but they didn't know him. They knew about maybe what he did, but they didn't truly know who he was. And so Paul makes that statement, and I echo it so often in church, that we have to have some sort of foundation in our beliefs. Knowing Christ is one thing. But having faith in the promises that he gives you is a completely different matter. There are many atheists out there who believe Jesus Christ was a real person. They believe that he came, he taught, he did things, but that he is not the Messiah. In fact, they would go on to say that God doesn't exist. But they believe Jesus does, which is kind of a weird paradox. Because if we as Christians assert that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then obviously God exists. So knowing about Jesus is much different than just simply acknowledging him as a real historical figure. And Paul makes that statement in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and God raised him from the grave, then you shall be saved. Right there is the beginning pieces to your faith. Christ is Lord. He died and rose from the grave. Now I had put in my sermon notes some outlies of the Apostles' Creed, but I just want you to pay attention when we recite that in a moment. The second portion of the Creed, where we acknowledge who Jesus Christ is, that 
is where your faith is. To profess that acknowledges what you believe about who Christ is. So pay close attention to it. Because in that we see the promises of the forgiveness of sin, the resurrected body, and the eternal life given to us. That is what we believe. So having simple faith is all it takes. But having faith in something, having faith in Christ, and having faith in what he did, those promises that he offers, that's the Christian faith. Acknowledging what Christ has done. And that's this water that he's offering to this Samaritan as he crosses the cultural boundaries. He is approaching to her, and he's offering her this gift. Now, we know that Jesus has made other statements that he came first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles, because he came first preaching to the Jews to wake them up, to get them out of this slumber, to call them back to the God that they had worshipped. And once he establishes that, then he moves his ministry on into the Gentile world and preaches both to Jews and Gentiles. And that's what Peter and Paul and all the apostles will then go on to do. And as the early church is established and flourished throughout the centuries, we, as the Gentiles, have become wrapped into this fold of Christianity. Because that is the promise that Christ gives to the Samaritan woman. And, it's, and that right there is the beginning trickle of what we see as the church today. That we come and worship here in Stratford, Iowa, and we worship the same God that they do in Des Moines, that they do in Minnesota, that they do in Africa, we worship collectively as a body of confessional Christians the God who created us. More importantly, we worship Christ who has come to redeem us. Redeem us from sin. Just as he points out the sin of the Samaritan woman, he points out your sin to you, and he calls you to acknowledge it, but to know that you are forgiven of that. In your baptism, your sins have been washed away you have been baptized into a death like Christ so you can experience a resurrection like his. This is what the promise is that he gives you. But more importantly, he sits there at the well, waiting for you, waiting to offer to you this free, quenchable, life-saving truth. And the acknowledge that only faith can save you, but only through him can salvation come to the world. Only through Christ can the world be saved. There is no other. There's nothing in this world that can offer salvation, redemption, forgiveness of sin. It is only through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is the gift that he freely gives to all people, not to just the Samaritan woman, but to each and every one of you sitting here. You have the same forgiveness. If he can have a conversation with a woman who's committed adultery with five different men, he can have that conversation with you and me. If he can redeem Paul who was murdering Christians and on his way to murder more Christians, he can have this conversation with you. And he can offer this same forgiveness that he gives to Paul, to the Samaritan woman, and to the, her whole village. He gives it to you. Freely. No strings attached. Nothing that you have to do. All you have to do is believe. And that belief is even given to you. Because it's not something that you conjure. I've made this statement numerous times. Christianity is an illogical religion. It doesn't make sense. We worship a God who came, born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, never sinned, was crucified on a cross, died, put into a grave, and then rose from the grave. And then ascended to heaven with countless witnesses. Doesn't quite make sense. But yet, you have the faith. You believe. Because that belief was given to you through the word preached. Through the Holy Spirit working into your ear and bringing that truth into your heart. That faith that you have when you, co when you show up here on a Sunday morning and you profess your faith in who Christ is. And as we will do here in the Apostles' Creed. Amen. If you would please rise for the reciting of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit 
and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Mighty God, strengthen us as brothers and sisters in your church so that we may joyfully obey your will. Strengthen and bless those who preach, teach, and shepherd congregations. Keep them faithful to your word so that they may diligently speak your truth to the flocks to which you have called them to serve. Lord, in your mercy. Sustaining God, renew us in the gift of baptism. Throughout this Lenten journey, may your promise of new life in Christ move us to repentance and transformation. Cleanse our hearts and strengthen our faith and keep us faithful in the covenant of baptism. Lord, in your mercy. God of righteousness, you call your people to strive for justice and peace in all the world. Following in the example of our Lord Jesus, grant wisdom and compassion to all in authority that they ha may govern with justice and equity, raise up faithful servants who will serve as peacemakers in the places where violence and war is daily reality, and shape us to be those who bear peace in our ordinarily, ordinary daily interactions. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, hold in your tender care all of those who suffer in any way, physically, emotionally, or spiritually, Strengthen and support caregivers and medical professionals that they may act with compassion and minister with technical skill. We pray especially for Matt Anderson, Lila Bergwin, Marilyn Carlson, Marie Carlson, Elaine Ubbin, Jerry Harris, Donna Robinson, John Anderson, Judy Lang, Rodney Patterson, Rhonda Patterson, and Barb Williams. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend of all of whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. Now for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. <clears throat> 